Buenas is brought to you by Guam Police Department Recreational Boating Safety Program, Department of Public Health and Social Services, Division of Children's Wellness, Bureau of Child Care Services, Guam Economic Development Authority, Premier Dentistry, Pacific Daily News, and the Marianas Variety. Buenas and half a day, Marianas. I'm Alana Chargaloff of Fison. Thanks for watching. Today is Wednesday, March 22nd. Following today's headlines, Polly Suba brings you another Buenas talk with Mayor's Council of Guam President and Mayor of PT Jesse Alec on the planning of this year's Liberation Day anniversary festivities, Guam's largest annual celebration. Here are today's top stories from the Marianas Variety. NMI District Court Chief Judge Ramona Manglonia found that Imperial Pacific International has defamed USA Fanter Corporation and awarded the plaintiff $500,000 in damages. The court said IPI's two press releases published in two CNMI newspapers defamed USA Fanter of its reputation as a reputable construction contractor having done business in the CNMI for over 30 years and that defamation caused USA Fanter damage. According to the court its findings, IPI essentially conceded that its 2019 press releases accusing USA Fanter of lying and inflating fees was defamatory, but contested the damages demanded by USA Fanter. The court also noted that USA Fanter presented four witnesses and 28 exhibits to establish its claim of defamation, while IPI did not present any witness to contradict any of USA Fanter's evidence. In other news, Mariana Southern Airways is still offering inter-island flights, even as Governor Arnold Palacios reiterated that there are no funds available for the $8 million sole source federally funded contract that former Governor Ralph Torres signed with MSA last year. MSA Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Stan Little said Palacios' criticism of this being a sole source contract, while factually correct, is patently unfair, as the criteria for receiving such a contract contract was satisfied under the law. The contract was also signed by the CNMI Attorney General. Little said they still believe in the original business plan that was built and that 18 months of government subsidy and verbal support or silence from the administration can lead to a sustainable long-term air service solution that can last for generations. And a whistleblower is requesting the Office of the Public Auditor to investigate two Board of Education members, Gregory Borja and Maisie Tenorio, for possible corruption when they donated their federal professional development funds to community organizations they are affiliated with. Two memoranda attached to the whistleblower complaint indicated that Borja made $12,000 in donations to the Rotary Club of Saipan, of which he is now a high-ranking club officer, and that Tenorio may have have abused her authority by making a $3,000 donation to the Northern Marianas Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, of which she is the executive director and administrator. According to the whistleblower, such donations are impermissible under Title II of the Federal Rules on Grants and Agreements. Finally, from the Variety, Commonwealth Ports Authority Executive Director Christopher Tenorio submitted his courtesy resignation to the CPA Board of Directors. Tenorio said he has yet to hear from many of the board members whether or not they have accepted his resignation and declined to comment when asked why he was resigning. The CPA Board has received a copy of a transition report in informing the Palacios Apatang administration that CPA is an entity in crisis and seemingly on the threshold of catastrophe. For more on these stories and others, pick up a copy of the Marianas Variety or visit mvariety.com. Up next are your headlines from the Pacific Daily News and a Buenas talk on this year's Liberation Day plans. Buenas and half a day, Marianas. The health of our community is our number one priority. Our people deserve access to integrated medical services here at home. And Guam's medical campus project is rapidly evolving from a notional future project to a current state-of-the-art quality health services center for Guam and the region. 
To learn more about the Guam Medical Campus and plans for land and infrastructure, financing, medical services, and more, visit us online at guammedicalcampus.com today. Welcome back to Buenos. While the 37th Guam Legislature was in an emergency session to appropriate $30 million, an amendment document that looked to be proffered by Senator Chris Duenas looking to cut funding for teacher and administrator pay was circulating on social media. In fact, progressive Democrats of Guam shared it as well. According to Senator Duenas, he filed a criminal complaint with the Guam Police Department against who he says is the author, Julian Jansen. Madam Chair, I take a point of personal privilege right now. I have warned every member of this body because an official document has, our document has gone out in official format of this legislature of an amendment that has not been proffered, has not been proffered. And I say that again, Madam Chair, has not been proffered. This evildoer, whoever put this information out there to try to gaslight and get people up in arms and angry and lie to the people of Guam, put out this amendment. This amendment says bill number 3237, Senator proposing amendment. Of course, it would be myself, CMD, Christopher M. Duenas. And it says to add a new section to bill 3237 COR to read. Section three, reprogramming of funds. All funds under the educator pay plan as authorized by public law 36107 that were allotted for pay raise, in, pay increases to teachers and administrators shall be reprogrammed for the maintenance and repair of school facilities and infrastructure. Madam Chair, this is a lie. This is a straight up lie. This amendment has never been proffered and I want every news media to report there's a damn liar either in this body or an evildoer outside of this body. And if I find out and I get information that anybody in this august body, this distinguished 37th Guam legislature, put this garbage out, they will be facing an ethics complaint, post haste. Duenas in a release said this is an unacceptable act and any person who uses an official government document to spread false information should be held accountable for their actions. In headlines from the Pacific Daily News today, money to pay for school repairs shouldn't come at the cost of a raise for school staff. Acting Guam Department of Education Superintendent Judy Wanpat told lawmakers Tuesday. Senators and education officials went back and forth for hours over Bill 32, which would give Guam DOE $30 million for school repairs. The bill aims at the excess revenue from fiscal 2023 and states the money would be better spent on school repairs than the $23 million needed for GovGuam's general pay raise. Wampat proposed that around $5 million be lockboxed annually for local schools to deal with delayed maintenance costs, which would help solve a long-term issue with underfunding. Wampat said that Guam DOE had already set aside $114 million in federal American Rescue Plan money, which was adequate to deal with immediate needs for facilities. Guam DOE officials clarified that they wouldn't turn down any funding. In other news, ownership of the Archdiocese of Agania's two major real estate properties that include the Chancery will soon officially change hands after a federal judge on Monday approved the total $5.8 million sale, proceeds of which would help settle clergy sex abuse claims and pay other costs in the Catholic Church's bankruptcy case. No one objected to the Archdiocese's $2.3 million sale of its chancery property in Agania Heights to Phoenix Foundation or nominee by the court's March 16 deadline. Senator Roy Kanata on Tuesday said he's considering a proposal to raise Guam's $9.25 minimum wage to as much as $15 an hour, or at the very least, increase it by 22% to mirror the pay raise for most government employees. A 22% increase would put the new hourly rate at $11.28. Kanata said there's no final rate on how much the minimum wage should increase without first getting input from the community at large. Unlike the 22% percent Gov Guam pay raise funding bill, there is no bill introduced yet to raise the minimum wage, which impacts mostly private sector employees. 
and Governor Lulian Guerrero has vetoed a pair of bills requiring legislative approval and greater transparency before a medical campus can be built on Eaglesfield property. The military delivered a lease for the property to the governor last week, and the document is currently under review by the Attorney General and the Governor's Office. Bill 12-37 requires prior approval from the legislature any time government property is bought, sold, transferred, leased or subleased for more than five years to or from the federal government or foreign governments. The bill would require the government committee responsible for planning the health care campus to comply with the open government law. All committee meetings would have to be noticed in advance and be open to the public. And finally, from the Pacific Daily News, Guam Unique Merchandise and Art, in partnership with the Mayor's Council of Guam, is holding another set of workshops to help residents start or establish home-based businesses. Participants will be able to visualize their dreams, conduct market research, identify their needs, and more. The next upcoming training is on April 15th at the Zotnia Community Center. For more on these stories and others, log on to guampdn.com. It's time for today's bonus talk with PT Mayor and MCOG President Jesse Alec on Liberation Day festivities. Followed by today's COVID report, the PBS University Archaeology Series schedule, and more. This is Buenas in the Morning. Buenas and half a day, Marianas, Guadalupe, Polly, Suba. Another edition of Buenas Talk. And now, welcome back to the PBS studio, Mayor Jesse Alec, President of the Mayor's Council of Guam. Half a day. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun to have a conversation with you, Mayor. Always looking forward to uh, your insight on some of the topics. And then, of, of course, uh, we got to talk about what's going on uh, within the villages, the Mayor's mm -hmm. Council of Guam. There was a meeting. Uh, a couple of issues that were brought up. I'll start first with asking uh, how the liberation festivities uh, are going, the planning's going. I mean, we're in mess tomorrow, it's March, but time yeah. flies by, right? Right, and, yeah. and then all of a sudden we blink and we're... Summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the 79th liberation is coming up and uh, it's never too early to start. We are certainly trying to make this a big event this year because of the pandemic, right? The last several years we haven't had uh, a full-fledged a liberation celebration like we typically uh, are used to. The, the big deal this time is we're really working on the Queen's Contest. Mm. So we're asking for any female that is 18 years to 25 years old uh, that wants to represent their village or a nonprofit organization uh, to, to give us a call at the Mayor's Council and let us know because we want to, to recruit you yeah. to be a, a contestant for this year's Liberation Queen. You found yours. I found mine. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it was great because okay. it was just a simple conversation about, mm -hmm. hey, why not, right? This is mm -hmm. what you could, uh, you would be able to experience. And uh, the young lady was so excited about it. And, and I'm even more excited because mm -hmm. it didn't take too much time to, to convince her. So really, the, the Queen's Contest, the experience is, it's, it's the greatest thing. Uh, and I think we probably have, we started our own relationship about, yeah. you know, liberation, through liberation. Mm -hmm. And it really is understanding the, or attending the, the memorials, the commemoration mm -hmm. of those memorials, understanding mm -hmm. the plight of our manyaina, uh, who we call the greatest generation, uh, understanding uh, our history, right? And so a lot of these young ladies will get to know that more. Um, or... Uh, contribute to those stories, mm. right? And so that entire experience, I think, is, is sufficient to say it's so worthwhile. Right. Uh, of course, you have to sell raffle tickets <laughs> to win, and the person, the lady that sells the most raffle tickets wins. Mm -hmm. And of course, you and the sponsor get a portion of that, of that, uh, of the, the profit. Uh, Let's talk about the, the funding. It's going towards the liberation festivities, including the parade and the carnival? That's correct. So 50% of, of your, of your um, raffle sales, ticket sales, will go towards all of our liberation festivities. Mm. 
The other 50% goes to your sponsor. Mm. So your sponsor could be the mayor's office, it could be a nonprofit organization. And then through your sponsor, you, the candidate and the sponsor decides how much each of them will receive from that 50%. Right. Putting on a parade is not cheap. It's not, and people yeah. think it is, right? Oh, you just decorate your, your trailer and run it down the road, but you don't you don't figure in uh, all the other hidden costs, like the- Oh, you get to shut down the road. Well, well, to shut down the road, it doesn't cost us anything to shut oh, down. Oh, I didn't it's know that. It's a permit, right? It's a permit, and you, well, they I tell you yes the or no. The police and the fire are well, there. Oh, so what costs there are is, of course, we, we need to make sure that there's uh, toilets, proper toilets ah. along the entire route, mm. and you don't realize how many toilets we have to put mm. uh, portable toilets down that route. So that costs us a lot of money. Uh, a stage, of course, for everybody. And we typically provide a stage also for our survivors. Mm. So putting up a stage in that uh, short mm. amount of time costs a lot of money, right? Mm. Because you, you can't put it up weeks in advance. You have to put it up the day before and take it down that, that day mm. uh, just because it's on the Marine Corps Drive. So that is actually a big chunk of, of what a parade. Decorations, I imagine, And decorations too, too yeah. Of course, Because we, we could not be do decorations. Oh yeah, we but could then, not. Why, why would you want to look at it? But then on the day of, it'd be like, yeah. I'm a Malu. <laughs> yeah, you. Who, right? who wants to see something like that? Why? Oh, yeah, yeah, why didn't yeah. you put any effort in our liberation? And yeah. we're not like that. We yeah. want to put a little, you know, yeah. pizzazz into yeah. these things. So that costs money. But the, the not only the parade, but also the the memorial ceremonies cost something, right? And it may not be. Mm -hmm. We're not building the monuments, but the ceremony to conduct the ceremony. There's some cost into that. And sure. So, of money that goes into into those things. This year, I want to announce plans, but we don't have plans sure. yet. I, I mean, I wish I could announce it first well, on your show. I well, will do it. I'll invite you right back. You <laughs> let me know when you're ready to announce. What I will. Here. I will. So but I do love the way you've pivoted because I have to say, maybe I just wasn't paying attention, but I feel like in the last couple of years, we've really put the focus on the memorials. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll, we'll continue to do that okay? Uh, because it's so important. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, everything that we're going through now with uh, the military buildup, uh, with the different opinions about the buildup, mm -hmm. I think it is important to understand our history, our past, and it's important to hear the stories of Armanyaina to, to actually move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think understanding all of that, understanding our issues these days, mm -hmm. you know, our current issues, I think will we'll, we'll set us you know, will set us in the right motion to move sure. forward. Um, and so though definitely the memorials are always the most important for me. Uh, and we try to make that a big part of our commemoration mm -hmm. for liberation. That always begins with uh, the Menengen ceremony. And that's typically around July 3rd, mm. 3, 4, 5. Um, and yeah. again, those days are not yet confirmed, but we'll certainly uh, let everybody know. A lot of our, our Manaya and our Manamko want to attend those ceremonies, so we try to put it out as quickly as we can. So they can plan, because everyone needs to plan, right? Yeah. I love <laughs> so, seeing the golden girls around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? I yeah. Love them. And then it's just, and there's always prominent seating for them. And so uh, we're always very happy to have them as, as, as much as they can attend. Well, speaking of Manaya mm. or Manamku, right? I, it's important that we try to clarify some things because at the Mayor's Council of Guam, it was brought up that uh, there are some issues with the senior citizen centers, right? And can you just clarify so we can understand better what to look, what to be expecting okay. moving forward? So the senior centers are open, are currently okay. open, and they will remain open. Okay. Our issue with the Mayor's Council of Guam is really to turn over the operations or turn, or turn them back to the Division of Senior Citizens. Because they weren't originally yours. Because they were not originally okay. Mayor's Council of Guam. Uh, it was never a, a Mayor's Council of Guam operation. Okay. It was a process, uh, an operation under the Division of Senior Citizens. They contracted uh, an, another organization. So the two organizations that I know of in the past were, of course, GARP SPIMA was the very first one. Hmm and then Catholic Social Services was the, the, the last one before the Mayor's Council of Guam. And it is, it's our hope that Public Health and the Division of Senior Citizens will be able to find a contractor come October 1st, mm. uh, so that uh, at the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30, we can turn over these operations to the contractor. And again, the mayors that have these centers want to be a part of the, the Manamco uh, operation, uh, and want to assist them in their daily, you know, op um, daily activities. Sure. But the actual operation really needs to be taken over by someone else, by public health 
and whether they do it internally or they have a contractor, somebody else needs to do it. So it really is a lot of administrative stuff that right. needs to re be removed from the Mayor's Council of Guam because we have so many other things to do. Sure. Can you yeah. kind of share those concerns, though, um, uh, why it's important that your staff or why your staff is concerned with just basically transitioning back to their normal operation? Well, because we have so much, so many other projects and funding sources that need to get, uh, that need our attention. Mm. Um, we talk about the Recycling Revolving Fund mm. and how there's $1.5 million in that fund and every, there's vehicles that need to be removed, a refrigerator, a washer, stove, tires, all that stuff. So all, all of that, the, all of those things, our maintenance staff can handle. Mm. But the, the hiccup comes at the administrative portion with the invoicing and the paperwork. And the problem is we have one person certifying all of that for all of our programs. So you have the 19 villages, plus the 12 senior centers, plus the three adult daycare facilities. Uh, that's just that. Right, and and you don't remember that. I mean, don't forget that. And your law enforcement too. And we're law enforcement, right? And we're law enforcement. Right? So there's just so many other things going on. And when you realize that um, we can't, ha we can't, you know, we can't, we can no longer uh, take more than sure. we can handle. And the thing for me personally is, we need to provide our Manamco the best service we can. Mm. And if we cannot do it, we have to own up to it and say, hey, okay, we cannot do it. Somebody needs to do it. Somebody needs to take over because they deserve better than what we can give them. Mm. Not that we don't want to do it. And we'll always be there. We'll always, there is no one mayor that does not want to support them. Well, your but, senior citizen centers so, are so very close to the mayor's offices they, they too, are, right? Are. And, and so, a lot yeah. of the buildings are owned by the, yeah. by the mayors. So there is going to be a partnership. And there will always yeah. be, right? And so that's so we want to let, uh, we've, we've let public health know that we want to continue to be partners. But administratively, operationally, it has to return back to public health. And they have to be the one to, to decide on whether or not, they, again, they'll do that internally or uh, yeah. have a contractor. Well, you're one of the most optimistic people that I know, <laughs> not just as a mayor, but just as a, as a human being. And so, you know, working to get that process moving so October 1st happens, nothing's shutting down. Nothing is shutting down. And again, if, if public health needs more time for them mm -hmm. to figure out a contractor or however they want to continue the operations, the mayors will always be there. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to offer our assistance. We'll continue to do all the administrative work right. that needs to get done to, to keep the centers operational. Uh, again, it really is just to give them back the program that, that is theirs, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, uh, so we pray that, that they, they're able to find uh, a good uh, and then that's the other thing, mm. is uh, someone who's going to take good care of the program, right? So if, if public health is going to contract it out, make sure that the contractor is someone that will do good for the Manamco as well. That's, right. that's the bottom line. Right. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and so I kind of just wanted to give you um, the opportunity as well. If there's anything, I, I've seen what's happening in PT for you in Mestamoro. But any other things that you're looking forward to as we're, we're closing out Mesomore from some of the other villages? Malesu's got something going on too, the Crab Festival. The Crab Festival. So one of the things that all the villages are involved in uh, is the um, is a bookshelf that That's is right. right that the UOG Triton Press is uh, is coordinating with the mayors. Mm -hmm. And it, what's so important about this bookshelf is that not only. Uh, not only is it just to celebrate Chamorro Month, but because this bookshelf is going to be stocked with Chamorro books mm. and books written by Chamorro people, right? By our own people. And so it's really our hope, and I, me as the president and, and, uh, and the UOG Triton Press, we're really hoping that the villages will take this to another level and will bring more of our people out to these bookshelves, not only during Mess Chamorro, but throughout the year yeah and so if you've is seen it one of those take one uh, so it's not a, a take one leave okay. one book okay. because the, the books are not going to be replenished okay uh, but of course if it if it has to get to that I think UOG is willing to work work it okay out. because that's what we have in PT is you know take a book leave a book okay uh, but <laughs> we've kind of had to like change that up for tomorrow sure. month because you know all the tomorrow books that are being donated to us are not really uh, to be taken away sure uh, uh, but uh, but you know again, uh, Lola at UOG, she, there. I mean, those guys are are very 
they're great to work with. So if, if we can replace them and replenish them, I think we will. One of the things, the exciting thing about, about these bookshelves is inviting the families over to the, to the offices or to wherever they're located. The, your bookshelf in the village does not have to be in the mayor's office. It could be anywhere in the village. Okay. So that's the, the fun part. If you haven't been to Talafofo, you should check Talafofo out because they have an entire maze of a bookshelf, which is really kind of nice. Very interesting, yeah. We'll check it out. So yeah, it's, they've, and they've, what they've done is, well, you know, we're having a competition. <laughs> yeah. yeah we have a competition yeah so, so they're they're the front runners so i don't know i mean you know <laughs> you better up your game <laughs> yeah, pt yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what telefofo did mm -hmm. and if you're in telefofo they did a great mm -hmm. job because they used uh, local books chamorro books or books about guam and they created scenes in their learning center nice. so each has a you know each book has a scene uh, a, a different um create they, they created an art scene um in, I in do got to check that yeah. out. We all got to check that out. Mayor, it's always a, a pleasure. <laughs> Time just flies by yeah. having conversations with you. <laughs> got to invite you back, especially when you're ready to make that big announcement. for liberation. We'll do it right here on PBS. <laughs> okay. yeah, for sure. Okay. I'm happy to. Okay. Once again, thank you so much to the president of the Mayor's Council of Guam, the Mayor of PT, Jesse Alleg. Another edition of Buenos Talk right here on Buenos in the Morning. The health of our community is our number one priority. Our people deserve access to integrated medical services here at home. And Guam's medical campus project is rapidly evolving from a notional future project to a current state-of-the-art quality health services center for Guam and the region. To learn more about the Guam Medical Campus and plans for land and infrastructure, financing, medical services, and more, visit us online at guammedicalcampus.com today. As announced in the latest Joint Information Center release, number 1169, free COVID-19 community testing is available at the Department of Public Health and Social Services Northern Region Community Health Center in Dededo, Monday through Friday, starting at 9 a.m. and by appointment only. To schedule an appointment, call 671-635-7525. You can also get tested on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to noon at the Southern Region Community Health Center in Inalahan, although travel-related testing is not offered. Testing is by appointment only, so to schedule, call 671-828-7604. Up to four adults are allowed per vehicle, and don't forget to bring your photo ID. To view the most up-to-date COVID-19 information, including weekday surveillance summary reports, visit dphss.guam.gov slash COVID-19 or guamrecovery.com. For inquiries, contact 311 through a local number. Thanks again for watching Buenos. Have a positive and productive Wednesday and catch us live at 9 a.m. tomorrow on KGTF Channel 12, the PBS Guam Facebook, YouTube channel or the PBS mobile app. Buenos and half a day, Marianas. Buenos is brought to you by Guam Police Department Recreational Boating Safety Program, Department of Public Health and Social Services, Division of Children's Wellness, Bureau of Child Care Services, Guam Economic Development Authority, Premier Dentistry, Pacific Daily News, and the Marianas Variety.